Part 8 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 8 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Rent of Land. Conclusion of the Digression Concerning the Variations in the Value of Silver the greater part of the writers who have collected the money price of things in ancient times seem to have considered the low money price of corn and of goods in general or in other words the high value of gold and silver as a proof not only of the scarcity of those metals but of the poverty and barbarism of the country at the time when it took place this notion is connected with the system of political economy which represents national wealth as consisting in the abundance and national poverty in the scarcity of gold and silver a system which I shall endeavor to explain and examine at a great length in the fourth book of this inquiry. I shall only observe at present that the high value of the precious metals can be no proof of the poverty or barbarism of any particular country at the time when it took place. It is a proof only of the barrenness of the mines which happened at that time to supply the commercial world. A poor country, as it cannot afford to buy more, so it can as little afford to pay dearer for gold and silver than a rich one and the value of those metals therefore is not likely to be higher in the former than in the latter in china a country much richer than any part of europe the value of the precious metals is much higher than in any part of europe as the wealth of europe indeed has increased greatly since the discovery of the mines of america so the value of gold and silver are gradually diminished this diminution of their value, however, has not been owing to the increase of the real wealth of Europe, of the annual produce of its land and labor, but to the accidental discovery of more abundant mines than any that were known before. The increase of the quantity of gold and silver in Europe, and the increase of its manufactures and agriculture, are two events which, though they have happened nearly about the same time, yet have risen from very different causes, and have scarce any natural connection with one another the one has arisen from a mere accident in which neither prudence nor policy either had or could have any share the other from the fall of the feudal system and from the establishment of a government which afforded to industry the only encouragement which it requires some tolerable security that it shall enjoy the fruits of its own labor poland where the feudal system still continues to take place is at this day as beggarly a country as it was before the discovery of america the money price of corn however has risen the real value of the precious metals has fallen in poland in the same manner as in other parts of europe their quantity therefore must have increased there as in other places and nearly in the same proportion to the annual produce of its land and labor this increase of the quantity of those metals however has not it seems increased that annual produce has neither improved the manufactures and agriculture of the country nor mended the circumstances of its inhabitants spain and portugal the countries which possess the mines are after poland perhaps the two most beggarly countries in europe the value of the precious metals however must be lower in spain and portugal than in any other part of europe as they come from those countries to all other parts of europe loaded not only with a freight and an insurance but with the expense of smuggling their exportation being either prohibited or subjected to a duty in proportion to the annual produce of the land and labor therefore their quantity must be greater in those countries than in any other part of europe those countries however are poorer than the greater part of europe though the feudal system has been abolished in spain and portugal it has not been succeeded by a much better as the low value of gold and silver therefore is no proof of the wealth and flourishing state of the country where it takes place so neither is their high value or the low money price either of goods in general or of corn in particular any proof of its poverty and barbarism but though the low money price either of goods in general or of corn in particular be no proof of the poverty or barbarism of the times the low money price of some particular sorts of goods such as cattle poultry game of all kinds etc in proportion to that of corn is a most decisive one it clearly demonstrates first their great abundance in proportion to that of corn and consequently the great extent of the land which they occupied in proportion to what was occupied by corn 
and secondly, the low value of this land in proportion to that of corn land, and, consequently, the uncultivated and unimproved state of the far greater part of the lands of the country. It clearly demonstrates that the stock and population of the country did not bear the same proportion to the extent of its territory which they commonly do in civilized countries, and that society was at that time, and in that country, but in its infancy. From the high or low money price, either of goods in general, or of corn in particular, we can infer only that the mines, which at that time happened to supply the commercial world with gold and silver, were fertile or barren, not that the country was rich or poor. But from the high or low money price of some sorts of goods, in proportion to that of others, we can infer, with a degree of probability that approaches almost to certainty, that it was rich or poor, that the greater part of its lands were improved or unimproved, and that it was either in a more or less barbarous state, or in a more or less civilized one. Any rise in the money price of goods which proceeded altogether from the degradation of the value of silver would affect all sorts of goods equally, and raise their price universally, a third, or a fourth, or a fifth part higher, according as silver happened to lose a third, or a fourth, or a fifth part of its former value. But the rise in the price of provisions, which has been the subject of so much reasoning and conversation, does not affect all sorts of provisions equally. Taking the course of the present century at an average, the price of corn, it is acknowledged, even by those who account for this rise by the degradation of the value of silver, has risen much less than that of some other sorts of provisions. The rise in the price of those other sorts of provisions, therefore, cannot be owing altogether to the degradation of the value of silver. Some other causes must be taken into the account, and those which have been above assigned will, perhaps, without having recourse to the supposed degradation of the value of silver, sufficiently explain this rise in those particular sorts of provisions, of which the price has actually risen in proportion to that of corn. As to the price of corn itself, it has, during the sixty-four first years of the present century, and before the late extraordinary course of bad seasons, been somewhat lower than it was during the sixty-four last years of the preceding century. This fact is attested not only by the accounts of Windsor Market, but by the public fires of all the different counties of Scotland, and by the accounts of several different markets in France, which have been collected with great diligence and fidelity by Mr. Messants and by Mr. Dupree de Saint-Mont. The evidence is more complete than could well have been expected in a matter which is naturally so very difficult to be ascertained. As to the high price of corn during these last ten or twelve years, it can be sufficiently accounted for from the badness of the seasons without supposing any degradation in the value of silver. The opinion, therefore, that silver is continually sinking in its value seems not to be founded upon any good observations, either upon the prices of corn or upon those of other provisions. The same quantity of silver, it may perhaps be said, will in the present times, even according to the account which has been here given, purchase a much smaller quantity of several sorts of provisions than it would have done during some part of the last century. And to ascertain whether this change be owing to a rise in the value of those goods, or to a fall in the value of silver, is only to establish a vain and useless distinction, which can be of no sort of service to the man who has only a certain quantity of silver to go to market with, or a certain fixed revenue in money. I certainly do not pretend that the knowledge of this distinction will enable him to buy cheaper. It may not, however, upon that account, be altogether useless." It may be of some use to the public, by affording an easy proof of the prosperous condition of the country. If the rise in the price of some sorts of provisions be owing altogether to a fall in the value of silver, it is owing to a circumstance, from which nothing can be inferred but the fertility of the American mines. The real wealth of the country, the annual produce of its land and labor, may, notwithstanding this circumstance, be either gradually declining, as in Portugal and Poland, or gradually advancing, as in most other parts of Europe. But if this rise in the price of some sorts of provisions be owing to a rise in the real value of the land which produces them, to its increased fertility, or, in consequence of more extended improvement and good cultivation, to its having been rendered fit for producing corn, it is owing to a circumstance which indicates in the clearest manner the prosperous and advancing state of the country. The land constitutes by far the greatest, the most important, and the most durable part of the wealth of every extensive country, 
it may surely be of some use or at least it may give some satisfaction to the public to have so decisive a proof of the increasing value of by far the greatest the most important and the most durable part of its wealth it may too be of some use to the public in regulating the pecuniary reward of some of its inferior servants if this rise in the price of some sorts of provisions be owing to a fall in the value of silver their pecuniary reward provided it was not too large before ought certainly to be augmented in proportion to the extent of this fall if it is not augmented their real recompense will evidently be so much diminished but if this rise of price is owing to the increased value in consequence of the improved fertility of the land which produces such provisions it becomes a much nicer matter to judge either in what proportion any pecuniary reward ought to be augmented or whether it ought to be augmented at all the extension of improvement and cultivation as it necessarily raises more or less in proportion to the price of corn that of every sort of animal food so it as necessarily lowers that of i believe every sort of vegetable food it raises the price of animal food because a great part of the land which produces it being rendered fit for producing corn must afford to the landlord and the farmer the rent and profit of corn land it lowers the price of vegetable food because by increasing the fertility of the land it increases its abundance the improvements of agriculture too introduce many sorts of vegetable food which requiring less land and not more labor than corn come much cheaper to market such are potatoes and maize or what is called indian corn the two most important improvements which the agriculture of europe perhaps which europe itself has received from the great extension of its commerce and navigation many sorts of vegetable food besides which in the rude state of agriculture are confined to the kitchen garden and raised only by the spade come in its improved state to be introduced into common fields and to be raised by the plough such as turnips carrots cabbages etc if in the progress of improvement therefore the real price of one species of food necessarily rises that of another as necessarily falls and it becomes a matter of more nicety to judge how far the rise in the one may be compensated by the fall in the other when the real price of butcher's meat has once got to its height which with regard to every sort except perhaps that of hog's flesh it seems to have done through a great part of england more than a century ago any rise which can afterwards happen in that of any other sort of animal food cannot much affect the circumstances of the inferior ranks of people the circumstances of the poor through a great part of england cannot surely be so much distressed by any rise in the price of poultry fish wild fowl or venison as they must be relieved by the fall in that of potatoes in the present season of scarcity the high price of corn no doubt distresses the poor but in times of moderate plenty when corn is at its ordinary or average price the natural rise in the price of any other sort of rude produce cannot much affect them they suffer more perhaps by the artificial rise which has been occasioned by taxes in the price of some manufactured commodities as of salt soap leather candles malt beer ale etc effects of the progress of improvement upon the real price of manufactures it is the natural effect of improvement however to diminish gradually the real price of almost all manufactures that of the manufacturing workmanship diminishes perhaps in all of them without exception in consequence of better machinery of greater dexterity and of a more proper division and distribution of work all of which are the natural effects of improvement a much smaller quantity of labor becomes requisite for executing any particular piece of work and though in consequence of the flourishing circumstances of the society the real price of labor should rise very considerably yet the great diminution of the quantity will generally much more than compensate the greatest rise which can happen in the price there are indeed a few manufactures in which the necessary rise in the real price of the rude materials will more than compensate all the advantages which improvement can introduce into the execution of the work in carpenters and joiners work and in the coarser sort of cabinet work the necessary rise in the real price of barren timber in consequence of the improvement of land will more than compensate all the advantages which can be derived from the best machinery the greatest dexterity and the most proper division and distribution of work but in all cases in which the real price of the rude material either does not rise at all or does not rise very much that of the manufactured commodity sinks very considerably 
this diminution of price has in the course of the present and preceding century been most remarkable in those manufactures of which the materials are the coarser metals a better movement of a watch than about the middle of the last century could have been bought for twenty pounds may now perhaps be had for twenty shillings in the work of cutlers and locksmiths in all the toys which are made of the coarser metals and in all those goods which are commonly known by the name of birmingham and sheffield ware there has been during the same period a very great reduction of price though not altogether so great as in watchwork it has however been sufficient to astonish the workmen of every other part of europe who in many cases acknowledge that they can produce no work of equal goodness for double or even for triple the price there are perhaps no manufactures in which the division of labour can be carried further or in which the machinery employed admits of a greater variety of improvements than those of which the materials are the coarser metals in the clothing manufacture there has during the same period been no such sensible reduction of price the price of superfine cloth i have been assured on the contrary has within these five and twenty or thirty years risen somewhat in proportion to its quality owing it was said to a considerable rise in the price of the material which consists altogether of spanish wool that of the yorkshire cloth which is made altogether of english wool is said indeed during the course of the present century to have fallen a good deal in proportion to its quality quality however is so very disputable a matter that i look upon all information of this kind as somewhat uncertain in the clothing manufacture the division of labour is nearly the same now as it was a century ago and the machinery employed is not very different there may however have been some small improvements in both which may have occasioned some reduction of price but the reduction will appear much more sensible and undeniable if we compare the price of this manufacture in the present times with what it was in a much remoter period towards the end of the fifteenth century when the labour was probably much less subdivided and the machinery employed was much more imperfect than it is at present in fourteen eighty seven being the fourth of henry the seventh it was enacted that whosoever shall sell by retail a broad yard of the finest scarlet grained or of other grained cloth of the finest making above sixteen shillings shall forfeit forty shillings for every yard so sold sixteen shillings therefore containing about the same quantity of silver as four and twenty shillings of our present money was at that time reckoned not an unreasonable price for a yard of the finest cloth and as this is a sumptuary law such cloth it is probable had usually been sold somewhat dearer a guinea may be reckoned the highest price in the present times even though the quality of the cloths therefore should be supposed equal and that of the present times is most probably much superior yet even upon this supposition the money price of the finest cloth appears to have been considerably reduced since the end of the fifteenth century but its real price has been much more reduced six shillings and eightpence was then and long afterwards reckoned the average price of a quarter of wheat sixteen shillings therefore was the price of two quarters and more than three bushels of wheat valuing a quarter of wheat in the present times at eight and twenty shillings the real price of a yard of fine cloth must in those times have been equal to at least three pounds six shillings and sixpence of our present money the man who bought it must have parted with the command of a quantity of labour and subsistence equal to what that sum would purchase in the present times the reduction in the real price of the coarse manufacture though considerable has not been so great as in that of the fine in fourteen sixty three being the third of edward the fourth it was enacted that no servant in husbandry nor common labourer nor servant to any artificer inhabiting out of a city or borough shall use or wear in their clothing any cloth above two shillings the broad yard in the third of edward the fourth two shillings contained very nearly the same quantity of silver as four of our present money but the yorkshire cloth which is now sold at four shillings the yard is probably much superior to any that was then made for the wearing of the very poorest order of common servants even the money price of their clothing therefore may in proportion to the quality be somewhat cheaper in the present than it was in those ancient times the real price is certainly a good deal cheaper tenpence was then reckoned what is called the moderate and reasonable price of a bushel of wheat two shillings therefore was the price of two bushels and near two pecks of wheat which in the present times at three shillings and sixpence the bushel would be worth eight shillings and ninepence 
for a yard of this cloth the poor servant must have parted with the power of purchasing a quantity of subsistence equal to what eight shillings and ninepence would purchase in the present times this is a sumptuary law too restraining the luxury and extravagance of the poor their clothing therefore had commonly been much more expensive the same order of people are by the same law prohibited from wearing hose of which the price should exceed fourteen pence the pair equal to about eight and twenty pence of our present money but fourteen pence was in those times the price of a bushel and near two pecks of wheat which in the present times at three and sixpence the bushel would cost five shillings and threepence we should in the present times consider this as a very high price for a pair of stockings to a servant of the poorest and lowest order he must however in those times have paid what was really equivalent to this price for them in the time of edward the fourth the art of knitting stockings was probably not known in any part of europe their hose were made of common cloth which may have been one of the causes of their dearness the first person that wore stockings in england is said to have been queen elizabeth she received them as a present from the spanish ambassador but in the coarse and in the fine woollen manufacture the machinery employed was much more imperfect in those ancient than it is in the present times it has since received three very capital improvements besides probably many smaller ones of which it may be difficult to ascertain either the number or the importance the three capital improvements are first the exchange of the rock and spindle for the spinning wheel which with the same quantity of labour will perform more than double the quantity of work secondly the use of several very ingenious machines which facilitate and abridge in a still greater proportion the winding of the worsted and woollen yarn or the proper arrangement of the warp and woof before they are put into the loom an operation which previous to the invention of those machines must have been extremely tedious and troublesome thirdly the employment of the fulling mill for thickening the cloth instead of treading it in water neither wind nor water mills of any kind were known in england so early as the beginning of the sixteenth century nor so far as i know in any other part of europe north of the alps they had been introduced into italy some time before the consideration of these circumstances may perhaps in some measure explain to us why the real price both of the coarse and of the fine manufacture was so much higher in those ancient than it is in the present times it costs a greater quantity of labor to bring the goods to market when they were brought thither therefore they must have purchased or exchanged for the price of a greater quantity the coarse manufacture probably was in those ancient times carried on in england in the same manner as it always has been in countries where arts and manufactures are in their infancy it was probably a household manufacture in which every different part of the work was occasionally performed by all the different members of almost every private family but so as to be their work only when they had nothing else to do and not to be the principal business from which any of them derived the greater part of their subsistence the work which is performed in this manner it has already been observed comes always much cheaper to market than that which is the principal or sole fund of the workman's subsistence the fine manufacture on the other hand was not in those times carried on in england but in the rich and commercial country of flanders and it was probably conducted then in the same manner as now by people who derived the whole or the principal part of their subsistence from it it was besides a foreign manufacture and must have paid some duty the ancient custom of tonnage and poundage at least to the king this duty indeed would not probably be very great it was not then the policy of europe to restrain by high duties the importation of foreign manufactures but rather to encourage it in order that merchants might be enabled to supply at as easy a rate as possible the great men with the conveniencies and luxuries which they wanted and which the industry of their own country could not afford them the consideration of these circumstances may perhaps in some measure explain to us why in those ancient times the real price of the coarse manufacture was in proportion to that of the fine so much lower than in the present times conclusion of the chapter i shall conclude this very long chapter with observing that every improvement in the circumstances of the society tends either directly or indirectly to raise the real rent of land to increase the real wealth of the landlord his power of purchasing the labor or the produce of the labor of other people the extension of improvement and cultivation tends to raise it directly 
the landlord's share of the produce necessarily increases with the increase of the produce that rise in the real price of those parts of the rude produce of land which is first the effect of the extended improvement and cultivation and afterwards the cause of their being still further extended the rise in the price of cattle for example tends too to raise the rent of land directly and in a still greater proportion the real value of the landlord's share his real command of the labor of other people not only rises with the real value of the produce but the proportion of his share to the whole produce rises with it that produce after the rise in its real price requires no more labor to collect it than before a smaller proportion of it will therefore be sufficient to replace with the ordinary profit the stock which employs that labor a greater proportion of it must consequently belong to the landlord all those improvements in the productive powers of labor which tend directly to reduce the rent price of manufacturers tend indirectly to raise the real rent of land the landlord exchanges that part of his rude produce which is over and above his own consumption or what comes to the same thing the price of that part of it for manufactured produce whatever reduces the real price of the latter raises that of the former an equal quantity of the former becomes thereby equivalent to a greater quantity of the latter and the landlord is enabled to purchase a greater quantity of the conveniencies ornaments or luxuries which he has occasion for every increase in the real wealth of the society every increase in the quantity of useful labor employed within it tends indirectly to raise the real rent of land a certain proportion of this labor naturally goes to the land a greater number of men and cattle are employed in its cultivation the produce increases with the increase of the stock which is thus employed in raising it and the rent increases with the produce the contrary circumstances the neglect of cultivation and improvement the fall in the real price of any part of the rude produce of land the rise in the real price of manufacturers from the decay of manufacturing art and industry the declension of the real wealth of the society all tend on the other hand to lower the real rent of land to reduce the real wealth of the landlord to diminish his power of purchasing either the labor or the produce of the labor of other people the whole annual produce of the land and labor of every country or what comes to the same thing the whole price of that annual produce naturally divides itself it has already been observed into three parts the rent of land the wages of labor and the profits of stock and constitutes a revenue to three different orders of people to those who live by rent to those who live by wages and to those who live by profit these are the three great original and constituent orders of every civilized society from whose revenue that of every other order is ultimately derived the interest of the first of those three great orders it appears from what has been just now said is strictly and inseparably connected with the general interest of the society whatever either promotes or obstructs the one necessarily promotes or obstructs the other when the public deliberates concerning any regulation of commerce or police the proprietors of land never can mislead it with a view to promote the interest of their own particular order at least if they have any tolerable knowledge of that interest they are indeed too often defective in this tolerable knowledge they are the only one of the three orders whose revenue costs them neither labor nor care but comes to them as it were of its own accord and independent of any plan or project of their own that indolence which is the natural effect of the ease and security of their situation renders them too often not only ignorant but incapable of that application of mind which is necessary in order to foresee and understand the consequence of any public regulation the interest of the second order that of those who live by wages is as strictly connected with the interest of the society as that of the first the wages of the laborer it has already been shown are never so high as when the demand for labor is continually rising or when the quantity employed is every year increasing considerably when this real wealth of the society becomes stationary his wages are soon reduced to what is barely enough to enable him to bring up a family or to continue the race of laborers when the society declines they fall even below this the order of proprietors may perhaps gain more by the prosperity of the society than that of laborers but there is no order that suffers so cruelly from its decline 
but though the interest of the laborer is strictly connected with that of the society he is incapable either of comprehending that interest or of understanding its connection with his own his condition leaves him no time to receive the necessary information and his education and habits are commonly such as to render him unfit to judge even though he was fully informed in the public deliberations therefore his voice is little heard and less regarded except upon particular occasions when his clamor is animated set on and supported by his employers not for his but their own particular purposes his employers constitute the third order that of those who live by profit it is the stock that is employed for the sake of profit which puts into motion the greater part of the useful labor of every society the plans and projects of the employers of stock regulate and direct all the most important operation of labor and profit is the end proposed by all those plans and projects but the rate of profit does not like rent and wages rise with the prosperity and fall with the declension of the society on the contrary it is naturally low in rich and high in poor countries and it is always highest in the countries which are going fastest to ruin the interest of this third order therefore has not the same connection with the general interest of the society as that of the other two merchants and master manufacturers are in this order the two classes of people who commonly employ the largest capitals and who by their wealth draw to themselves the greatest share of the public consideration as during their whole lives they are engaged in plans and projects they have frequently more acuteness of understanding than the greater part of country gentlemen as their thoughts however are commonly exercised rather about the interest of their own particular branch of business than about that of the society their judgment even when given with the greatest candor which it has not been upon every occasion is much more to be depended upon with regard to the former of those two objects than with regard to the latter their superiority over the country gentlemen is not so much in their knowledge of the public interest as in their having a better knowledge of their own interest than he has of his it is by this superior knowledge of their own interest that they have frequently imposed upon his generosity and persuaded him to give up both his own interest and that of the public from a very simple but honest conviction that their interest and not his was the interest of the public the interest of the dealers however in any particular branch of trade or manufactures is always in some respects different from and even opposite to that of the public to widen the market and to narrow the competition is always the interest of the dealers to widen the market may frequently be agreeable enough to the interest of the public but to narrow the competition must always be against it and can only serve to enable the dealers by raising their profits above what they naturally would be to levy for their own benefit an absurd tax upon the rest of their fellow-citizens the proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order ought always to be listened to with great precaution and ought never to be adopted till after having been long and carefully examined not only with the most scrupulous but with the most suspicious attention it comes from an order of men whose interest is never exactly the same with that of the public who have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public and who accordingly have upon many occasions both deceived and oppressed it end of book one chapter eleven part eight end of book one of the wealth of nations of the causes of improvement in the productive powers of labor and of the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks of the people.